So hello everybody sitting there at home. This is Sue McDermott speaking and I and my little pal here, the little painted turtle guy, we are on a road trip to your home. Now this may seem a little strange, um, but that's how we do things this summer. So we're not going to be defeated by some little pesky virus. We are going to come home to you and uh, talk a little bit today about something that I hope will be of interest to you. So uh, my job uh, here at UCLA is to be a transplant physician to our liver transplant kids. And I thought what might be interesting to you today is to think about um, something I worry a lot about is managing long-term immunosuppression. Now the wonderful thing about giving this talk today is actually we now have miracles in our abilities to be able to bring these little babies all the way through decades of life to something as spectacular as their wedding day. And this is a picture of Lily over at least the first 24 years of her life and she's still going strong. So what I'd like to cover today in this chat with you is uh, some of the long-term risks um, that are common to all of the immunosuppressant drugs that we use, as well as some of the long-term problems that we see with specific drugs. I also am going to cover how to decrease the risk of these immunosuppressive drugs and what we need to do as we look to the future and hope for things to actually get better. Now, obviously, these immunosuppressive drugs are amazing. They are lifesavers for your children. But as you all know, there are risks. And the ones that I want to focus on that are common to all of the immunosuppressants, the two biggies, are the risk of infection and the risk of malignancy. So we're going to start with infection. So um, the risk um, varies with the amount of immunosuppression. The more the immunosuppression, the higher the risk for infection. And it also varies with time after the transplant because obviously with, for many of your children, as the years go by, we try to use less immunosuppression. And that's going to be a theme you're going to hear me repeat uh, time and time again. But of course, um, these are kids and common childhood illnesses still happen to your transplanted children, just as they do to any children, and they happen often. These are little people that are off to school, they're off to daycare, they're infected frequently by all of the common childhood illnesses. But what I want to emphasize is when you should actually get a bit more worried. So the things to look out for is if your child has an unexplained fever, and particularly if she or he just looks sick you're experienced parents, so you know when your child is sort of looking like, oh, they just look like they've got a cold. But when they start worrying you that they look sick, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Particularly if they're very sleepy. Particularly if they look very pale, or even if their color of their skin looks a bit mottled. And even though they have a fever, you may notice that their hands or their feet seem quite cool. When else you might worry? The breathing seems to be too fast or even potentially worse, too slow. You may get the sense um, that your little one's heart is beating too fast. You can't understand why they're not urinating. There's excessive vomiting or diarrhea and if they've developed new bleeding, bruises or unusual rashes. Now, when you worry even more, is when your child has a central line, a pick line, or any other tube or device in their body. You worry if they've been in the, in the hospital recently or they've had surgery recently. Another reason to worry more is if there's been a recent increase in immunosuppression, which may happen if there's been an episode of rejection recently. And obviously any recent contact with a known serious illness what to do. Well, the first thing you're going to think about is asking for help. And if you're really worried, don't hesitate to call 911. But also call us, your transplant center, as soon as you can, because we do know you and we know your child. One of the things that I often have to stop parents from doing is starting to drive 
to their transplant emergency room without calling. Please call us so we can help you because we may direct you not to our ER, your one where your transplant occurred, but to a much closer emergency room and be sure to take this advice. We can always bring you to your transplant hospital if we need to. So these are some of the things to worry about, but most of the time, many of the usual childhood infections are easily handled at home, just as you do with your other children. But you're always going to be that bit more careful with a child who's on immunosuppression. So how do we go about preventing infection? Well, I can't emphasize enough that common sense is important. And we have to let these very special children of yours, even if they're immunosuppressed, they've got to live their lives and live them fully. So what are some of the key things? So this isn't rocket science. One of the most essential ways that we can help prevent infection is immunizations. Now there is still some controversy about should we be immunizing um, with live vaccines, measles, mumps, and chickenpox. I won't discuss this in depth today, but in general, we avoid live vaccines. Remember, a flu shot is needed every year. And of course, in this day and age, we just keep hoping for new vaccines, particularly, of course, for COVID-19. We keep wishing for that one. One of the things we also have to think about is whether the early childhood vaccines that your child received continue to be protective. And one of the two uh, problems I see is losing the efficacy, the effect of the vaccines, particularly for hepatitis A and B. And we can actually test for those. Another thing to, complete, to continue to advocate for when you take your teenager to the pediatrician is the teen shots. It's interesting to me that quite often these are actually somehow forgotten. So immunizations, an essential part of pediatric health care. Again, the common sense that you've been hearing over and over in the news in the era of COVID-19. The simple things are still relevant. It doesn't matter whether it's COVID-19 or any other time of the year. Hand washing, covering those coughs and sneezes, keeping your house clean and hopefully schools, daycare centers, etc keeping food safe and the way you prepare it, the water safe at home, and of course, being somewhat selective when you eat out. And this is not just now with COVID-19, this is always. And of course, and I think we've really emphasized this in the last several months, it's our job to teach our children well about these simple things to prevent any infection. And of course, with the emphasis on what's happening in our community right now, um, the, what is happens in the community at any time, whether it was um, before COVID-19 or after it, is knowing what's going on locally. Know when there's measles, mumps, chickenpox, hepatitis A, whooping cough. These are illnesses that occur in our communities all the time. And of course, the new threats, can't mention that often enough with COVID-19, you have to stay attuned. Now, for many of these illnesses that I list here, there are effective vaccines, but we don't know, and you don't know, if everyone has received them. And so your child may be at risk for some of these much more common problems that have been around for a long time. Sometimes it means by knowing what's happening uh, in the community, you're not going to send your child to school. And again, this is irrespective of the emphasis on all of this with COVID-19. And the hardest part is actually balancing the risk of infection with wanting to protect your child's normal life as possible. And that's never more true than right now as we negotiate this most unusual time that we're in. In terms of other ideas about preventing infection, some of you have children with special risks of their own. Some of your children may have had surgical complications recently or even in the distant past that put them at more risk for infection. Some of our liver transplant children actually don't have a spleen. It may have been surgically removed and we know that that is a risk for infection. Long hospital stays, another risk. Recurrent infections that may actually damage the graft, urinary tract infections for kidney transplant recipients, 
and bile duct complications leading to infection in the liver for our liver transplant children. And you need to think about geography, where you live, problems like valley fever, whether you live in rural areas with contact with farm animals, what your pets are like, how well they are kept immunized themselves, and some of your travel plans, which of course right now is all on hold. Our job as doctors in helping to prevent infection um, oftentimes fall under understanding when we should use prophylactic medicines. The common ones that you will see us use is Bactrim, which prevents a serious form of pneumonia out in the community called pneumocystis carinii. We use Valcite to control some of the herpes viruses like CMV and EBV. But you'll notice that we only very rarely use other antibiotics to prevent infection. Our job is also to spend a lot of time checking up about immunization status, watching out for new risk factors for your children, trying the best we can to avoid too much immunosuppression, which is actually the hardest part of our job, and most importantly, continuing to educate you and your children. I'd now like to move on to the other um, immunosuppressant complication that is common to all of the immunosuppressant drugs that we use, and that is the risk for malignancy. Now, this is always a very scary kind of topic, and luckily it is still quite rare. But the one particular kind of malignancy that we do tend to see in children uh, after transplant is this entity called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. And in this picture here, you can see all these very uniform looking cells, which are the cells that have been infected by the Epstein-Barr virus. So what is PTLD? Well, first of all, it's a whole spectrum of disease from something that's quite mild to something that can be very serious. Most of the time in children, this form of malignancy is driven by a particular virus, the Epstein-Barr virus. And this is the same virus that we heard about, you know, when we were growing up, the so-called kissing disease or mono. And this is a ubiquitous virus. It's around us all the time. What this virus tends to do, however, particularly in immunosuppressed patients, is it infects cells in the blood and converts them over to cancer-like cells that keep on growing out of control and then can travel to other organs. The most risky population are the children less than five years of age at the time they're transplanted who are infected with the virus for the first time after their transplant. And this is most often the scenario in our liver transplant children who generally are much younger than our kidney transplant children at the time of transplant. So PTLD is diagnosed by a biopsy of a suspicious lesion. Um, lump somewhere, um, something that looks like it is uh, in an area of the body where it shouldn't be. And that diagnosis is very, very important. It could be as simple as just enlarged tonsils, or it could be under the microscope, um, a serious problem like a full-blown lymphoma. Some of these PTLD type cancers can be cured just by stopping immunosuppression. This is really only an option in liver transplant children. Others need medications of various kinds and various versions of chemotherapy to stop the problem. But the very good news is that over the years we have got a lot smarter about how we can actually effectively monitor for this virus and prevent the virus turning itself into full-blown PTLD. Other malignancies, thank goodness, are rare in children as a consequence of their immunosuppression. We worry about skin cancer, however, particularly, of course, in California. Lots and lots of sunblock and big hats is the answer. The other very preventable kind of cancer that is initiated by a virus, the HPV virus, causing cervical and penile cancer, can nowadays be very successfully treated in terms of prevention by immunization. The HPV vaccine, that three series uh, course of vaccines that we give to our teenagers, 
both boys and girls. In screening for any problems caused by the HPV virus is particularly important in our older teen girls. And so they end up oftentimes having the dreaded pap smears much earlier than certainly uh, children, girls who are not immunosuppressed. The other important job that we have to do is educate our young people for their life as an adult when it comes to this risk of malignancy. We spend a lot of time talking about avoiding the most common of all the carcinogens, of course tobacco. We counsel our teenagers as they move into adulthood and into adult care systems that they should be very attentive to the advice about getting screening mammograms, colonoscopies, prostate screening, all of the preventative cancer measures that are so important for us in our adult years. But one of the unanswered questions is, should we actually start doing these screening examinations earlier in adulthood than is recommended for the rest of us who are not immunosuppressed? I'd now like to just turn to some of the risks, particularly focusing on the long term, for the specific drugs uh, that we use for our transplant children. So of course, probably the most important one that you're all very familiar with, and the linchpin of our success in transplantation uh, in the modern era is tacrolimus. But its most important risk factor in terms of long term is the effect on decreasing kidney function. And this actually occurs in all patients to some extent. It is dependent of the, of the level of the drug in the bloodstream. The higher the levels run, the more the toxicity. And this is one of the reasons we are so particular about measuring those trough levels and doing it accurately when we, when we ask you to take your child um, into the lab for their routine testing. One of the questions that we still are not totally sure of the answer is, is it progressive over many years? And can the use of tacrolimus eventually lead to kidney failure? And it is true that we have seen children who have required kidney transplantation uh, in their early adult years. So tacrolimus is a life-saving drug, but we have to be very careful about how we manage it in context of its effect on so how can we help manage this kidney toxicity of tacrolimus? Can never emphasize enough the importance of always keeping your child hydrated. Water, 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 and more water. Remembering that if your child has a relatively simple illness with vomiting and diarrhea, their dehydration risk happens much faster than in a child who's not immunosuppressed with the harm to the kidneys that that can cause. We also have to be very careful of other drugs that can damage the kidneys if you're already taking tacrolimus. And the most common one for you to think about at home is to avoid using the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the ibuprofen-containing drugs like Advil and Aleve. Some antibiotics, particularly those that we use in the hospital setting, can be also toxic to the kidneys and increase the toxicity when tacrolimus is also being used. For your doctor, our job is to try again to use the least amount of tacrolimus as we possibly can, and that again is our hardest job. In terms of mycophenolate mofetil, which you may know of um, with its trade name, Salcept or Myphotic, the early on problems with GI upset and some bone marrow suppression generally are manageable in the long term. Quite honestly, my biggest worry with this particular drug is the high incidence of birth defects that can occur. This is a known and serious problem. 48% of women who become pregnant with mycophenolate on board will have a spontaneous abortion, and about 22% who do carry their, um, their child to term will have a incidence of birth defects, which is quite high. So it is really, really essential that we educate our teen girls and their parents very early in their teen years. If the uh, young lady becomes sexually active, the management 
requires to be safe the simultaneous use of two kinds of birth control. So this is very difficult for any teenager to pull off. And so oftentimes what we end up doing is replacing Salcept with azathioprine in our young ladies in whom we think the risk of pregnancy is high. Steroids, many, many side effects. Um, we always try to avoid these in the long term, but many of our patients do end up on steroids uh, for a number of years. Particularly in the liver patients, we try to get our kids off their steroids relatively early. This is not a luxury that all the kidney recipient children uh, can enjoy. The list of negative effects from steroids is a long one. So here are some of the major ones. Stunted growth, decreased bone density, something I really worry about in long-term use. Stomach ulcers, increased weight, increased blood pressure, increased blood glucose. So these are serious problems that you really don't want to have to deal with over years and years of use. And so minimizing steroid use is again a very important problem. Sirolimus and Everolimus are drugs that are used now more often in some of our children, particularly if they've had problems with rejection. The earlier problems that we see in the short term, bone marrow suppression, especially low platelets, high blood lipids, and protein loss in the urine can extend into the long term. The biggest worry I have about the long term consequences of using these drugs is their effect on wound healing. So some of your children may end up having a operation later, many years down the road from their original transplant, and if they're receiving sirolimus or everolimus, their wound healing may be significantly de delayed. Managing sirolimus and everolimus is helped by our ability to follow the blood levels and I think it's true that we try our best to use these drugs sparingly. They are potent immunosuppressants. So now that I've worried you with all of that, um, I want to spend some time on what we really can do to minimize the risk of our immunosuppressant drugs. So the principle is really pretty easy. We want to use the least amount of immunosuppression to protect the graft and prevent rejection for what may be decades of life for these wonderful little ones that then turn into adults and hopefully progress all the way through their adulthood. This is most definitely a balancing act. And the problem is that each patient reacts differently to their transplant. Some patients need more and some need less immunosuppression. The problem we have as your doctors taking care of your children, that we still don't have the ability to measure precisely what each child needs. We don't know how to individualize immunosuppression based on a blood test, based on some test that will tell us how immunoreactive your child still is against their graft. And to make it more difficult even still, we know that the immune system changes with time in terms of how it looks at that foreign organ, the graft itself. So the bottom line is the immune system is way smarter than the doctors and the scientists studying it for so many years. So what can we do? We try to be very thoughtful. We measure blood levels a lot. We only make small adjustments usually only one drug at a time if possible. We keep checking the graft function after we change immunosuppression. We try to insist that your children take their drugs regularly. Whenever we start to try to minimize drugs, we watch out very carefully for rejection. And unfortunately, we do know that sometimes our patients and sometimes even our parents try to minimize drugs themselves. So we have to be very careful about rejection because we do know that late rejection in particular is a very bad thing. It's much harder to reverse. It can lead to permanent damage to the graft and it can lead to graft loss and it can even lead to loss of the patient, which is always a tragedy. And of course, the teenagers 
we love them dearly, but it sometimes feel like feels like a bomb has gone off in your life. So trying to handle minimizing risk in the teenagers when it comes to their immunosuppression. And as they want to be independent and try to manage things themselves is another very big challenge. The breakthrough that we really need to minimize these risks, apart from better drugs, is to figure out how we could avoid immunosuppression altogether in the long term. It's a very simple concept. It's very difficult to do. Basically, what we need to learn how to do is to trick the immune system into thinking that the transplanted organ is actually not foreign at all, so that the immune system actually ignores or tolerates the graft. If we could manage to figure out how to do that, we wouldn't need drugs in the long term. However, this is a very, very hard thing to do. Again, as I said before, the immune system is much smarter than we are, but we have been trying. We keep on trying to try to see if we can achieve what many of us talk about is the holy grail, seeking the holy grail of transplantation tolerance. So I leave you with this picture. It's actually an old uh, painting of the exhausted knights getting to the altar eventually of the holy grail. And I'm sure there are many scientists out there, many of my physician colleagues um, in research and transplantation, who still feel that they haven't quite reached the final altar. And they are very tired of trying, but they keep on trying. So that's the promise for the future. So I look forward to um, talking with you all um, a little bit later in the week. I believe it will be Sunday morning and answering any of your questions. And in the meantime, I hope that you are all staying safe at home. When you go outside, you're very careful, but remembering that life is still to enjoy and that your very special transplanted children are some of the most wonderful miracles that I've had the honor of taking care of during my time here at UCLA and as a transplant physician. Thanks very much, everybody, and goodbye.